uh, welcome to this freezing room, <laughs> you know, and also welcome to today's meeting on Iranian policy towards the Iraqi and Syrian crisis. Our speaker today, Professor Jubin Gudarzi, is not a stranger to the Wilson Center. Uh, he has spoken on a number of occasions at the center, mostly on Syria and Iran relations, a relation which is very special to Iran and goes back to the early days of the revolution and to the father of the current uh, president of Syria. Um, Mr. Gudarzi will discuss today for us not only Iran's ongoing support of the Syrian government during the civil war, but also Iran's relation with Iraq and where the country stands uh, on the spread of ISIS in Syria and Iraq. Dr. Gudarzi is the deputy head of the International Relations Department at Webster University in Geneva, Switzerland. He was previously a consultant on Middle Eastern affairs for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees in Geneva. He has also worked with a number of US and UK research institute and foundations, including the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C., the Royal Institute of International Affairs, Chatham House in London, and the Ford Foundation in New York. He is the author of Syria and Iran, Diplomatic Alliance and Power Politics in the Middle East, which was published in 2009, and I believe we had a book talk for him uh, way back when the book came out at the center. So you have the floor for 30 minutes. I don't know why there is such a big distance between us, but... <laughs> right. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Yes. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Svander, for that um, kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here again. Um, uh, I've been here several times. Uh, it's a pleasure and privilege as usual. Um, what I'd like to do today is, um, uh, well, as an author of a book, as Dr. Svander mentioned, on Syria and Iran, I'd like to look at recent developments in Syria and Iraq um, and also why ISIS shed also a little bit of light, why ISIS was able to gain traction in, uh, uh, in Iraq and Syria, and uh, also then look at things, developments in the context of Iran's relations with these two key Arab countries. Uh, the opinions I'm expressing here are solely mine. They are not the opinions of my uh, university or my department. Um, in, um, um, uh, in, in, in Webster, Geneva. And um, uh, to begin with, I think um, I've put just two, because uh, towards the end I'm going to focus a lot on Iraq um, and Iran's, uh, the importance of uh, Iraq for Iran. But I'm going to, as I said, cover some different ground um, at the outset. Um, I think in view of the protracted and bloody nature of the uh, Syria conflict since 2011, the destabilization of the Levant, the rise of ISIS, and the spillover of the conflict in, in Iraq should not have come as a surprise to anyone. Um, I think the mainstream media in the West and the Middle East have been selective um, and presented a skewed picture of developments and trends in Syria, in Iraq, and also the, the region. In general, I would argue that the ideologies and policies of the authoritarian regimes in the region, such as Syria, Iran, and also the Gulf Arab states, coupled with short-sighted and ill-conceived policies um, of outside <laughs> powers have contributed to the current conundrum, the imbroglio that we see in the region. 
uh, I'd like to first give a little background also with regard to Syria and like what's happened and then put it in the context of, of other things, more, more pertinent things that I want to um, cover. Uh, the, the Ba'ath Party has been in power in Syria for over half a century, since 1951, if you want to look at it, take it back to 63. And the Assad regime, or the Assad dynasty, if you'd like to uh, look at it that way, has been at the helm since 1970 for 44 years. For most of its history, um, it has been, and um, I, I would argue, a secular authoritarian dictatorship that has prevented the rise of civil society and also initially, in its initial years and decades, clamped down on Islamists um, in Syria. In view of the socialist underpinnings um, of the Ba'ath, traditionally the Syrian state had been the main provider um, of social and economic support to the rural and urban working classes. Uh, in the two decades prior to the outbreak of the Syrian revolt in 2011, the regime began to disengage in this respect. The emerging vacuum, I would argue, was filled by Islamic charities and organizations. Uh, hence, Syria's social and cultural fra fabric became more conservative and more religious in the years prior to the revolt in the two decades that followed. Uh, concomitantly, the Assad regime also began to ease restrictions on religious groups aimed, aiming to accommodate and co-opt them. Uh, in the run-up to the, uh, uh, also in the run-up to, during and after the 2003 Iraq war, the regime tried to channel the activities and energies of Islamist groups abroad by aiding and abetting the flow of Islamist fighters, um, both Syrian and foreign, uh, including those of Al-Qaeda, um, to fight against U.S.-led forces in Iraq and also the Iraqi government forces, uh, also providing um, uh, uh, al-Qaeda with, with, with a base. Uh, I would also argue that there are other factors which facilitated um, the rise of the Islamists prior to and after the 2011 unrest. Uh, one being the exposure of Syrian expatriates, uh, especially those who worked in the Gulf states after the 1973 oil boom and the decades that followed, who worked in the Gulf Arab, Arab states, their exposure to Salafism and also Wahhabism. Uh, two, the social and, tri and tribal connections between Syria and Saudi Arabia. Uh, three, the indoctrination of Sunni Syrian uh, clerics in religious institutions, which had been full funded by Gulf Arab states. And also after the um, unrest in Syria and once it morphed into an armed conflict, the flow of Islamist fighters um, from uh, other countries, from Afghanistan, from Chechnya, from Bosnia, Kosovo, Iraq, and other Arab states. So what you have then uh, is, um, I would argue, overall, uh, in terms of what the regime did um, in the last two decades, its strategy backfired as religious groups began to assert themselves and they started to challenge the, um, uh, the, the state, the Syrian state, by, er by as early as, you know, even already three years before the outbreak of the unrest in 2008. Um, and then, of course, eventually, um, once the, um, uh, the unrest erupted and it morphed into an armed conflict, they took up arms against their former Syrian uh, Ba'athist benefactors, a classic case of blowback. Um, generally looking and then trying to tie it into my main, uh, my main uh, topic here, um, I would argue that there are several main reasons for the unrest, uh, for the eruption of the unrest in Syria in March 2011. Uh, one, of course, was the Arab Spring, the inspiration that that provided to Syrians, um, you know, so basically a domino effect, a knock-on effect. One of, uh, the other reason, of course, was the lack of political liberalization and openness in Syria. Initially, after Bashar came to power, it, th there seemed to be, there might be a period of liberalization, political openness, the so-called Damascus Spring, that did not happen, of course, um, so that was ill-fated. Um, and also, uh, number three, I would argue the deterioration of socioeconomic conditions 
um, in the country in the years prior to the revolt, especially with the privatization policies that were pursued, the crony capitalism that evolved, and the growing gap between the haves and the have-nots, and these were accentuated by the economic policies which were implemented, especially in the mid middle of the last decade in the 21st century by Bas Bashar al-Assad. Uh, the other element which a lot of people don't talk about, which also had a significant impact, I would argue, was the drought of the previous five years between 2006 and 2011, which had a devastating impact on Syrian agriculture and also led to the flight of workers from the rural areas to the urban centers, so made the situation in the urban centers very volatile. Uh, so this had a negative impact on about 1.5 million Syrian farmers, and Syria is not a big country in terms of just over 20 million in, in terms of population. So for the farmer, how many people they feed and all that. And keep in, keeping in mind that um, about 25% of Syria's GDP is composed of agricultural activity and about 30% of Syrians work in the um, agricultural sector. The fifth um, uh, reason, I would say, um, which contributed was the covert efforts of Syria's regional and international rivals to undermine um, the, the Assad regime. Um, this, um, as Dr. Svanderi mentioned, the Syrian-Iran alliance is a long-standing alliance. It's been around for 35 years. And from the 80s onwards, intermittently, there have been e um, efforts to try to decouple, to prize the two partners apart. In the mid-80s, something which I talk about extensively in, in the book, I wrote, um, you have the U.S., the Soviet Union, Saudi Arabia, and Jordan that, that tried to basically decouple the two um, uh, and also um, try to, by extension, undermine Iran's regional power and position and weaken Hezbollah in Lebanon. In the 1990s, another way of trying to do this was uh, by you know, engaging Syria in the peace process, uh, in the peace negotiations with Israel, which were mediated by, brokered by the U.S., um, hoping that a peace deal would eventually lead to the, the weakening of ties between the two and eventually, you know, maybe the demise of the alliance. And also 1996 onwards with regard to um, encouraging the evolution of the Turkish-Israeli um, axis, nexus. Um, Um, so I would just, um, yeah, right. So, um, I would, uh, yeah, so in, in this regard, um, with regard to what happened then in, um, uh, the 2000s, um, I think in the immediate period following the 2003 Iraq war, there were renewed efforts to prize the two apart, Syria and ir Iran, and also to try to weaken them. Uh, this was in part reflected by Washington, the Bush administrations, more specifically um, policies to aid armed insurgencies or along the periphery of the Iranian state, for example, in Kurdistan, Baluchistan, and other places. Um, uh, Dr. Basfandiari referred to my stint at the UN. I was working with UNHCR during this period covering Iraq. And I remember after the overthrow of Saddam Hussein, uh, we were trying to s look into the efforts, uh, prospects of repatriating Iraqi refugees from Iran to um, Iraq. And uh, so, so I remember during this time that um, some of our colleagues who went to the field, to the border areas and came back, um, you know, talked about reports that um, uh, the U.S. Uh, U.S. forces in Iraq were funneling arms across the border in the summer of 2003 to Iraqi Kurdistan, trying to fuel the um, Iranian uh, Kurdish insurgency. Uh, I think if you look at it in those terms, uh, I would argue that the invasion of Iraq initially, um, the Bush administration had had a far more ambitious agenda than just changing the status quo in Iraq. It was also seen as a way to put pressure on both Tehran and Damascus. Um, in addition to what I said about you, the other element which I, I would argue is the fact that in May of 2003, Im immediately after the war, um, Iran, which was very much concerned that it might be the next target in the Bush administration's war on terror, um, basically uh, conveyed uh, a message, made an overture towards the U.S. through the Swiss embassy, through Ambassador Gul Tim Guldiman, 
um, saying, you know, the Iranians were very much interested in negotiating a grand bargain on the nuclear issue, Arab-Israeli issues, Hezbollah and all that. And this, of course, was rejected by the Bush administration. And as I said, then you also had the, um, the issue in Kurdistan. And of course, later on, it's out in, uh, in the public domain in terms of the, um, the support um, for Jundullah in, in Baluchistan, if, if you'd like, and I can talk about, um, more about this later. Um, with regard to Syria, um, again, in terms of trying to weaken the Syrian-Iran alliance, weaken uh, Syria, uh, also um, because of its patronage of Hezbollah, and also because of the fact that it was fueling the uh, insurgency in Iraq during these years. Um, and one must keep in mind that at the height of the insurgency in 2007, about three out of four to four out of five foreign suicide bombers in Iraq actually came into the country from Syria. There are also efforts to try to basically undermine uh, the Syrian regime. So a number of, you know, there, are, there are a number of incidents, I've just put a few in my slide, um, irrespective of who one thinks started the 2006 Lebanon war. Uh, I think it was pretty apparent that once the war started, the Bush administration found expedient to try to block the passage of a UN Security Council resolution for a ceasefire, hoping that the war would lead to the weakening and or the destruction of Hezbollah, which was one of the trump cards that Syria and Iran had. Um, one can also mention the 2007, the Kibar bombing of the um, Syrian uh, nuclear site, and then a series of, of other events and assassinations which happened in Syria, including one or two, this is before 2011, of one or two sen senior Iranian commanders, and also in early 2008, the assassination of the Lebanese operative Imad Mugnia, and also in the summer of 2008, the assassination of Syrian General Mohammad uh, Soleiman. So I, I think these were there, and I think if one looks at what happened in the initial um, period of the protests in Syria, it was not as black and white as one, one sees. I think there were other elements at work. I'm not saying that what happened was a foreign conspiracy. No, there was all those elements that I mentioned, but I think there were other forces at work in, in this regard. Right. Um, sorry about that. I should have. I'm uh, getting over jet lag. I just flew in yesterday, late yesterday, into Gen uh, from Geneva. So I'm a bit, little bit um, lightheaded and uh, dizzy. So um, I apologize for that. Um, so I kind of skipped. I forgot to turn one or two of the slides. Um, I think after the 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 start of the unrest in Syria in March 2011 as the political protests and the demonstrations and the regime's heavy-handed and brutal response led to the transformation of the conflict into an armed uh, insurrection. Uh, by the latter half of 2011, a proxy war emerged in Syria. Um, I think in order to understand the, the Syria conflict and its dynamic, one must understand that it has three dimensions. Um, one is the domestic dimension, the Assad regime against its domestic opponents, the regional dimension, Syria's ally, Iran and its allies, supporting uh, against the, the opposition's allies, Saudi Arabia and company, and also the international dimension, Russia supporting the regime, and also the, the West, the US and its allies supporting um, the, the opposition. Um, however, the mainstream media, I would argue, um, resisted reporting on this new reality in the two years that followed. It was only in the latter part of 2013 that there was a gradual and reluctant shift in the narrative and the presentation of facts. Why was this? I would argue that this was because they were reluctant to acknowledge that some of the backers of the Syrian opposition and some of the groups they were supporting espouse I extremist Islamic ideologies such as Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra Front, uh, and, and, and so on. So, um, uh, so in this regard, I'm of course talking about at times governments, but also organizations and private individuals in Gulf Arab states who've, who provided finance and material support for the extremist groups. 
um, which flourished in Syria as the conflict dragged on and the violence basically polarized, radicalized, and brutalized um, people and society within Syria. Um, the other element um, which was there also um, was, um, I, I think, based on also reading articles in media and also conversations I've had with former U.S. officials, I think there was an undeclared line of thinking in Western capitals and also in Washington that as long as the Syria conflict dragged on, as long as it did not spill over and destabilize the region, it was okay because it was weakening the Assad regime and Iran was basically pouring in resources, financial material to prop up the regime. So you have articles, you know, that Syria is turning into Iran Stalingrad. Um, I remember several months ago uh, talking where somewhere where a former senior U.S. official said that Syria has become Iran's Vietnam, um, so on and so forth, which it was in a sense that was true, but I think it's, very, it's a very dangerous pop proposition and, and way of thinking if you just narrowly think about the conflict in those terms because um, it, there were many facets to the conflict. So um, I would argue that essentially the West, um, if I may use the term, has made a Faustian bargain with the Gulf Arab states in view of the close political, uh, strategic, and economic ties it has with them. Uh, politically also necessitated by the hostility and anti-Americanism, anti-Westernism of the Iranian regime. Uh, economically, the importance of uh, Persian Gulf uh, oil supplies, uh, supplies from the Gulf Arab states um, to the international markets, and of course the strong economic links that exist um, also, uh, both commercially and also militarily. Um, uh, uh, you may recall that in 2010, uh, Saudi Arabia concluded a $60 billion arms agreement with the U.S., which is the largest overseas arms sale in, in history. And also another recent example earlier this year, you had um, Qatar basically sign a um, $11 billion arms deal with the U.S. And also you have the bases al Udaid in, um, in uh, the al Udaid Air Base in Qatar. And of course in Bahrain, you have the uh, home of the U.S. Fifth Fleet um, in the Gulf. Um, let's turn to Iraq now um, in terms of what happened and trying to put in contact what's happened in Iraq and the why ISIS was, as I said, tried to has gained traction. Um, Iraq has become, became fertile ground, uh, why it became fertile ground for extremism. This is due to several reasons, I would say. Um, if you just look at generally con uh, Iraqi history during the bath from 68 to 2003, um, you had 35 years of dictatorship uh, where you had no political freedom, no civil society. Iraqi society became atomized. You also had three devastating wars that in inflicted inestimable damage on the Iraqi people and the country. And uh, number three, you had 13 years of crippling UN sanctions that, had ex that exacerbated the situation and tore apart the fabric of Iraqi society and impoverished the people. And also it's important that people fell back uh, on clan, tribal, and sectarian loyalties because of the weakening of the Iraqi state. Uh, subsequent to the U.S. invasion and occupation um, of Iraq, uh, there were a number of mistakes that were made first by the CPA and successor Iraqi governments. One was the dismantling of the Iraqi armed forces and dismissal of Ba'ath officials. So overnight, you had over 400,000 people who were made uh, unemployed, which of course then uh, helped fuel the insurgency. The failure to provide security through the deployment of sufficient um, numbers of U.S.-led coalition troops. Um, you had about 160, 70 in total that were deployed, 1,000 that were deployed, while if you do the arithmetic, the rule of thumb being for peacekeeping operations for, uh, for every 1,000 inhabitants, you need 20 peacekeepers. And at the time, of course, the U.S. Um, Army Chief of Staff, General Eric Shinseki, and the commander of uh, U.S. CENTCOM, Anthony Zinni, had, had and clearly indicated that they needed f at least four to 450,000 troops in Iraq to maintain the peace. Um, the other element was embracing privatization and free market economics in a country which is an economic wasteland um, and, um, and needed sound, some sound state-led 
initiatives and policies to rebuild the economy. So that made things worse. And then post after 2005 elections and after the U.S. withdrawal in 2011, I would argue the growing discriminations towards the Sunni Arab community, minority by the al-Maliki administration, which increasingly over time became authoritarian, corrupt, and heavy-handed. Um, at the same time, in defense of um, Nuri al-Maliki, I, 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 I must say that I think um, it's unfair to blame everything on him. I think if you remember, recall back in 2006, he was put in, plugged in as prime minister. He was seen as a consensus candidate because he was seen as weak, malleable. Adawa, the party that he came from, was one of the few Iraqi parties, Shia parties, which did not have a militia also. And also during the two years that followed back, that was always rife with rumors of a potential coup. And of course, and then you had the insurgency, which was being fueled by Syria and Iran, particularly by the Syrians uh, and, the, and the situation. So al-Maliki, because of his own situation and because of the country, I think he decided to assert himself, to surround himself politically and military, militarily with people he trusted. And with time, you have basically more and more Shias and, uh, and also then uh, growing uh, discrimination towards, towards the Sunnis. Um, and, uh, and also the other, the other thing about al-Maliki, a lot of people looked at him or perceived him as an Iranian puppet. I don't think that was necessarily the case or always the case in terms of if you, look, if you remember the 2010 elections in Iraq, uh, uh, Iran actually did not favor al-Maliki. They, they favored the Iraqi National Alliance, which consisted of Iski and also the Sadris. They were um, initially against al-Maliki's state of law coalition. Uh, but then, uh, because of the, the, elec the, the results of the election, they had to basically try to bring the two parties together to form a government to keep Iyad Alawi out. So, so I think you know, it's a bit simplistic to just call him uh, an, an Iranian puppet. Um. So what you have then is, um, just as I said, um, uh, just very quickly, because um, I'm running out of time, uh, the, um, I would argue that, uh, as you know, the, uh, uh, it, ISIS started first in Iraq in 2004. It, it, its origins were in Iraq. It was blunted in part because of the U.S. surge, uh, and it, it, it kind of transformed over time and then basically moved, shifted to Syria, where it gained traction and then basically came back to Iraq with a vengeance in 2013-14, um, and you know, in addition to seizing large swathes of territory in uh, Syria, in northern and, and, eastern, in, and eastern Syria, then came back and overrun a lot of Iraq, especially Al Ambar province, um, which of course is important. It's a huge province, um, and it's important in the sense that also 95% of the population in Al Ambar province is composed, composed of uh, Sunni Arabs, and it has common, it has borders with uh, Syria, Jordan, and uh, Saudi Arabia. With regard to recent development in terms of the, the success of ISIS in terms of uh, overrunning uh, much of Ir northern and central Iraq, and also um, uh, threatening Baghdad once the, the, crisis, the, the, the situation in Iraq became a full-blown crisis for everybody concerned, both Iraq, Iran, and the West and the United States. Iran has provided different types of support. Uh, one is basically um, air support, sending over seven Su-25 frog foot ground attack planes, um, also deploying drones in the Al-Rashid Air Base and later mo moved to al um, uh providing arms and ammunition, to both uh, the Kurd Iraqi Kurdish Peshmerga fighters and also the Iraqi army, providing technical uh, and surveillance assistance in terms of setting up equipment and posts to monitor ISIS communications. And also when, it was, when it's been deemed necessary since June, deploying its own forces to try to combat ISIS. So um, uh, in terms of uh, reports during June that um, elements of the Quds force were, uh, were deployed to try to protect certain sites and cities, the cities in Baghdad, Samarra, and Karbala, and also in August where in the Kurdish north, um, if reports were correct, that elements of the 81st Iranian Armored Division were, were, were deployed to um, help the, the Kurds fight um, ISIS. Uh, the others, of, of course, is to provide 
uh, advice on military strategy and tactics to both the Kurdish Peshmerga uh, units, the Iraqi army, and the Shia militias, you know, Asal al-Haq, um, Qatab Hezbollah, and all that, and like, which was exemplified in August, September, in uh, breaking the siege of Amerli, where, of course, also, interestingly enough, the U.S. actually provided air support for the operation to break the ISIS siege um, of, of Amerli. Um, as I mentioned the, the last time I spoke here at, at, at the Wilson Center in the summer of 2013, um, I, I, I actually indicated that Iran was concerned about the situation in Syria and also the potential spillover into Iraq. And I mentioned at the time, Syria is important for Iran, but even more important than Syria is Iraq because it's a neighboring country. Iran shares, they, they, they share a 1,500 kilometer uh, border, eight, 900 miles if you convert it. Um, uh, Iran has had a history in terms of invasions throughout history from the West, from the time of the ancient Greeks, the Romans, the Turks, uh, the Arabs, so on and so forth. And of course, more, more recently in terms of what's etched in the Iranian psyche is the eight-year war with Iran, which is the longest and bloodiest war in contemporary Middle Eastern history and also one of the longest wars in the history of the 20th century. So it's important to have a friendly government or ideally an ally there. So um, it's important as far as Iran is concerned to have an ally in Baghdad in order to ensure its Western flank and also, in a sense, geopolitically, to basically try to check uh, Saudi Arabia, as long as there is rivalry between the two countries, uh, and also to project power then across from Iraq into Syria, the Levant, uh, into Lebanon. Uh, also, as you know, o over the past several years, r trade relations between the two countries have grown. Um, so in 2011, they the 2012, they stood at around $11 billion, and last year in 2013, the value of trade between the two countries stood at around $12 billion. So, and another thing to keep in mind is if Assad, if the Assad regime falls in Syria, the value of Iraq is going to increase significantly for Tehran. Uh, in terms of recent developments and concerns for Iran, we're, we're the, there are several. Um, I've tried to just um, highlight these, uh, um, I'll just very quickly try to go over them. Uh, one, of course, in, in view of the recent statements by the president of the KRG, Masoud Barzani, about a referendum for Kurdish independence in Iraq is Iran is concerned uh, if that goes ahead for, for several reasons. One is, of course, if the Iraqi Kurds decide to become independent, its security implications for Iran and Kurdistan, uh, they may want to go their own way or join this new Kurdish state. Um, and if you have Iraqi Kurdish in, in independence, this could lead to the destabilization of Iraq and also the destabilization of spillover into Iran. And the other concern, which is, of, of course, we've, we've, we've experienced, we've seen over since 2003, is that Iraqi Kurdistan could be a base or continue to serve as a base for the U.S. and Israel against Iran. With regard to ISIS, um, of course, Iran does not want an ISIS victory. They're seen as a direct threat to Iranian national um, uh, security. Um, uh, we, we had reports back in the summer of uh, clashes, border clashes of Qasr Shirin between ISIS and Iranian security forces, and other reports unconfirmed that there were also clashes in, in, within Iran in Azerbaijan between ISIS and Iranian security forces. And the other thing, if there is an ISIS victory, this could basically uh, encourage Sunni minorities in Iran, like the Kurds, the Baluchis, and the others, to um, oppose Tehran. And in general, uh, also, even if ISIS does not prevail, whether it prevails or not prevail, the weakening of Iraq, and if Iraq just kind of becomes uh, different pieces, um, the destabilization of, of the um, Iranian state. And uh, recently, of course, several Iranian the commander of the Iranian ground forces and the deputy commander of the uh, armed forces general staff has made uh, explicit, have made explicit statements saying that Iran would not tolerate having ISIS on its borders. Um, to conclude, um, with regard to recent events, I, I would argue that the Obama administration has, seems to be pursuing contradictory policies. On one hand, assisting the Iraqi Kurds and the newly formed government of Haider al-Abadi uh, to fend off and roll back the advance of ISIS, and at the same time committing itself to help um, the moderate opposition in the Syrian conflict. I would argue that there is no military solution to the conflict in both countries, especially in Syria. In Iraq, the al-Abadi administration must take substantive steps to, um, to include su the Sunni Arab population, 
Otherwise, any military gains on the ground against ISIS will prove to be short-lived. I think the, um, the recent last week of appointing a Sunni Arab defense minister uh, was, was, a welcome, uh, was a welcome sign. In Syria, I would argue, pumping more arms, resources, and money to the Syrian opposition uh, is going to only aggravate the situation and may lead to further empowerment of radicals and emergence of new extremist groups and the spillover the conflict into neighboring countries. And I mean, it's already occurring to some degree in Lebanon, Jordan, and all that. So I would argue one has to be clear that the Syrian conflict has become a proxy war and that any effort by the West and its allies to defeat Assad will be met by further steps by Iran and also Russia to prop up the Damascus regime. Um, the only sound uh, solution is some sort of political settlement uh, and through negotiations. I don't think military, uh, mili the military and, and military political negotiations and military action are mutually exclusive. One could use things such as provi uh, providing an, an ultimatum to the Assad regime to, to, come, to come to the negotiating table and show more flexibility, threatening strikes or maybe making strikes using cruise missiles or drones uh, at certain regime assets to nudge them to the negotiating if you don't want to endanger American lives and pilots. Um, so I think you know that, that it's not black and white. And also, I, would, I think the results to date, in terms of what has happened on both sides of the fence, especially in Washington and Tehran, have not been promising. Um, have been, uh, you know, uh, I think it was a big mistake during the Syrian peace talks in Montreux, Geneva, uh, in the winter for, um, for Iran not to be in invited due to, uh, um, I mean, I was there and I know senior UN officials for the UN. The UN was put in an extremely awkward position whereby they initially extended an invitation to Iran to attend and due to US and also Syrian opposition pressure, the, uh, the invitation was withdraw, withdrawn. And then you've had also then Iran rebuffing certain Iran-American overtures. And then recently last month in Paris, after the crisis in Iraq erupted, where you had 26 countries come and Iran was not invited due to U.S. and Gulf Arab pressure, the United, uh, the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. Um, so I think that was not a wise move um, in the sense that um, uh, Iran uh, is a key actor in the region. It has major stakes in both Iraq and Syria. Uh, and um, if one wants to reach a solution, one needs to include it irrespective of which side it's, it is on in the political fence. And I think the statements by, after both conferences, by John Kerry that Iran can play a role on the sidelines and the margins were unhelpful. Um, uh, you know, Iran is not a banana republic. It is a country with over 75 million people, geographically important, has major resources. And, um, and I've mentioned this before, this is my last comment. Um, I've run over time, I'm sorry. But um, I, I, I believe a lot of times in Western capitals and in Washington, there's a very binary view and interpretation of Iran. Either Iran is weak, passive, or as Admiral Fallon once called, their ants, or it's a superpower in terms of and all that. Well, it's neither of those two extremes. It's a regional power, and it needs to be factored in uh, when one is trying to find solutions. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, let me ask you a uh, first couple of questions, and then we will open uh, the floor to uh, questions. Um, let me start with your last point. Uh, you, you, meant you talk about the need for negotiations between the various powers in Syria. We know that ISIS is there, and necessarily neither the Syrian government nor the opposition wants to negotiate with ISIS. Mm -hmm. The Syrian government uses all sorts of methods, including chemical, against its own people. The opposition also commits atrocities, what they should not do. So there is, I mean, and then you said the foreign players. So basically, who should negotiate with whom? I mean, Iran, Saudi Arabia should sit and talk together over Syria and ignore all the players on the ground. Turkey does not want to sit with the Syrian government. Mm -hmm. The opposition does not want to sit with Iran. So, so what kind of a solution is that? I mean, uh, Foreign Minister Zarif, 
in an on-the-record address at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York in September said, well, Iran will go along with an election, with the will of the Syrian people. I mean, how can you mm -hmm. conduct elections, you know? Yeah. So. Right. Uh, yes. Uh, no, um, I'm not trying to say it's a, it's a, it's a simple undertaking. It's very formidable. Um, but I said, I think everybody needs to be included. Anybody who is playing a role in terms of determining the outcome of events in Syria and Iraq needs to be included. And at some point, I, I think one should, as they say, never say never. Um, at some point, you may have to talk to ISIS, I, I, you know, if, if one, one wants to be realistic, trying to solve the problem. So um, I, I think a little bo bit more realism and pragmatism on both sides, on the pro-Syrian regime side, the opposition, and also with regard to what's happening in Iraq. I think more, more actors are on the same page with regard to Iraq, of course, than Syria need to, need to be included. Um, as I said, uh, well, I, uh, of course, everybody knows, and uh, one of the outcomes of the Gen Geneva Montreux meetings was it basically demonstrated the gulf, the gap that exists between the Syrian regime and the, the opposition. Um, and, uh, of course, you then had the rise of ISIS. So, um, so as I said, I don't think the political and military tracks are mutually exclusive, as I said, maybe some limited military action, an ultimatum or military action. You know, they've, the U.S. has been now hitting ISIS within Syria. They could also give an ultimatum to the Syrian regime or maybe at some, in some point actually undertake military strikes to basically nudge them and, and get the two sides talking and, and be present along with everybody else. That's the way I see it. Okay, follow up. Who can give ultimatum to the Syrian government? Is Iran and uh, capable of doing such a thing? Is Russia capable of doing such a thing? Will they do? Will they give an ultimatum to uh, Syrian the Syrian government? Right. Uh, well, in in my talk, I was talking about, for example, the U.S. But of course, I, I as I said, I uh, I think if well, Russia is at the table and also was disappointed with the fact that in the, the previous meetings, Iran had not been included. So um, Iran, of course, is trying to link the whole Syria situation, what's happening in Syria and Iraq, also to the nuclear things, which, of course, um, is a different topic uh, for, for our purposes. But, um, but, but eventually, um, I, I think uh, if those two countries, which have enormous power and influence and sway over Syria, are there, this could provide beneficial and lead to achieving headway in the negotiations. Okay, we'll open the floor. Uh, yes, please. Yes. Uh, please identify yourself. Short questions, no comments, please. I, I'm Rafael Leal with the Brazilian Embassy. When uh, Rouhani took power in Iran, his first uh, press conference, he gave priority to Saudi Arabia. Then after that, uh, Abdullah Hyan, the deputy foreign minister for Iran, he visited Saudi Arabia as well. Yes. And uh, recently, we had the meeting between Zarif and Al Faisal, the two foreign ministers. In CSIS, uh, Philip Gordon said that uh, the U.S. encouraged this approachment uh, between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran, and he implied that the U.S. maybe had uh, some kind of sponsor that meeting. Uh, could you comment, uh, could you uh, tell how do you see this possible approach between Iran and Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. and where does the United States stand okay. on this Thank possible you. approach? Thank you very much. Uh, okay, very quickly. Um, uh, there are many problems and obstacles um, in bilateral relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia. I mean, you you have two very different regimes with ideologies, their political orientations and all that, a lot of distrust, and you have these different conflicts burning throughout the region or potential conflicts, Yemen, Bahrain, the Bahrain issue, Iraq, Syria, and all that. Um, the, I, I see there could be a possibility where the two sides could thaw relations and cooperate with regard to ISIS in, in the Arab East. But um, I think if something like that were to, ha if it does happen, 
it could basically lead to short to medium term cooperation, tactical cooperation on these issues. But I'm skeptical it would be a major watershed and turning point in terms of improvement of relations between uh, Riyadh and Tehran. That's that's what I think. I, I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, both sides have toned down the rhetoric. You're right. Uh, yes, please. Uh, thank you. Faye Mokhtar with West Asia Council. Uh, after the invasion of Iraq and the rise of the insurgency, um, I believe that eventually the United States decided to uh, come to some form of uh, financial agreement with Muqtadar al-Sad and his uh, militia. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the same strategy or to a certain point uh, this can be done with the rise uh, and rise of uh, ISIS? We could come to some sort of financial agreement with them, give them money to Hashem or or there is no financial solution to this? Um, I think the situations are different in terms of in view of the amount of territory that ISIS controls at present in Iraq and in Syria and the resources that it does control in terms of oil, financial and all that. Um, it is in a far superior position compared to Muqtada Assad's movement. So I, I think that would be extremely problematic in terms of trying to cut a deal in, in terms of also because of their, their ideological orientation. I'm skeptical. In the back, please. Yes. Thank you. Um, Shaheen Nabi Davudi with the um, Wilson Center. Um, what changes in uh, Iran's policy, if there are any changes in your opinion, have resulted from uh, the U.S.-led coalition taking the fight to ISIS? Okay. What changes in Iranian policy? Correct. Mm -hmm. um, I, well, I don't, well, I think Iran is pursuing its own interests irrespect, well, I don't see much change for the moment, to be quite honest. I think um, both sides see ISIS as a threat and they're doing things irrespective of whether there is cooperation or not between the two sides. Um, uh, and of course, the, uh, as Dr. Svandiori said, the, the rhetoric has softened and I think Rouhani and his people definitely would like to see an improvement in relations between Tehran and Washington. Um, so, and that may occur in the weeks and months ahead of us, in the years ahead of us uh, w under Rouhani's presidency, but I do not see that um, becoming, uh, I, I, don't, I don't see that turning into a major rapprochement and normalization of relations between the two sides. I think as, as long as the, the current political establishment is in power in Iran, especially the spiritual leader Ayatollah Khomeini and the hardliners, there will be never normal relations between the two states, although there are some between the power, within the power structure who would like that. But they will block it, and there are those here in Washington who will try to block that also. Uh, yes, please. Um, in the middle, yeah. Yes. Hi, uh, Phil Schrafer, in, in, in retirement, no affiliation. Thank you for getting out of your jet, jet lag so quickly. Very impressive. Thank you. I'm not out of it. I'm just sorry. <laughs> sorry I'm, I, I apologize for my performance. It was, you know, substandard. So On my Saudi Arabia's role, as you have used, described it, vis-a-vis uh, -vis -vis ISIS, supporting ISIS, and as Bob, uh, Senator Bob Graham had pointed out, uh, playing a very un unpleasant role in our 9-11 tragedy. Uh, a New York Review a, a book suggested that maybe Saudi Arabia was getting tired by ISIS and that is it possible that they may change change their role and maybe become a more productive member and become a negotiating member? Uh, right. Uh, with regard to Saudi Arabia, and as I said, I, I talked in general terms with regard to the Gulf Arab states, in some cases you had governments supporting ISIS, in some cases it's been organizations or private individuals. Um, with regard to Saudi Arabia, of course, as you know, the crisis has erupted um, uh, over the past few months in Syria and Iraq. You, we've had, of course, the government of Saudi Arabia taking a, a very taking decisive steps and action against ISIS and participating in the bombing campaign um, against ISIS targets um, uh, in recent weeks. 
But um, as I said, it, th there, there are also certain fundamental structural problems. You have a conservative pro-Western monarchy, but you also have a society and religious um, establishment in Saudi Arabia, which is extremely conservative and basically espouses uh, a very, very conservative, traditional, hardline interpretation of Islam, which of course directly or indirectly fuels the uh, Sunni is Islamist extremism in the region. So. Uh, so th there are also there there are fundamental problems which need to be addressed in Saudi Arabia and some of the Gulf states, but I think the the regimes are very afraid of doing it, for, uh, you know, um, because they're they're um, they have concerns about alienating the people, the populations, and the religious people who might see them as being uh, corrupt, Westernized, or American lackeys or whatever. Uh, yes, please. Our last question. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Lara Gring. I'm an undergraduate student at Georgetown University. Um, I'm just curious, you mentioned in your last um, comment the binary vision of the U.S. with Iran between an ant and a significant power. Like, why do you think that is and why the U.S. would let that um, get so significantly in the way of negotiating and trying to find a solution to um, the problem with ISIS in Iraq and Syria? Um. If I understand your question correctly, why does why is there like a binary view interpretation of of um, well um, the, the there's a famous quote by the um, 19th century French intellectual and writer Alexis de Tocqueville that um, a simple uh, but false idea will always carry greater weight in the world than a true but complex one. So I think people like to look at things in very black and white terms and binary terms. Um, uh, wh when I'm in Iran, parts of the Middle East, I see that as the case there in terms of s the way people or certain people in government view the West or the United States. And at times, that's, of course, the view here in Washington. Uh, and of course, in view of the 35 years of hostility between the two sides, the hostage crisis, everything that has followed, um, and a very strong anti-Iran lobby in Washington, uh, I think it's very easy to, to kind of gravitate to one of those two extreme in, in, in um, uh, interpretations. So I, I think the truth lies somewhere in the middle, and one needs to see the nuances and complexities of the situation. So um, I'd like to think that's why I get invited here from Europe, so to kind of you know, show a different perspective, but maybe I'm wrong. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of enlightened people here in D.C. and elsewhere. Please join me in thanking Dr. Kudansi for his presentation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. You. Kendra, میاد شما رو فوری به وقت مصاحبه و اینا نداریم فوری میبرتتون برا اون مصاحبه بعد میارتتون دفتر باشه خواهش میکنم مرسی خیلی متشکرم بله 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 ب